Eighty and six years I have served my lord, and he has never done me any harm, but rather much good. How can I blaspheme my king and savior? From the start, by far, Polycarp was the one I was most concerned about, just because it is such an important, critical role to be filled correctly. I haven't done that much formal acting. This is not my career. It's, a, it's kind of a secondary thing and a secondary interest for me. But it's a way that I do what my calling is, and that is to be a minister of God's word, and acting is one vehicle that I use in carrying out that calling. I first found out about it on the Facebook page uh, for Indescribable, and I happened to look at it, and I thought, that really looks interesting. This is being filmed where? In Cincinnati. <laughs> like I'm going to go there. A couple of weeks later, though, I received an email from Rebecca Cook. She was assisting with the casting, and she personally invited me to audition for the role of Polycarp, which is something that just caught me by surprise on two levels. One, having a personal contact asking me to audition and then to be auditioning for the title role. So when something like that happens, and I've learned in my life, the Lord may be speaking in that somewhere. So I went ahead and was bold to do something that I've never done before, and that's produce a video audition and had uh, some friends assist me on that. As I sat there and I watched his audition, instantly I knew this was Polycarp, and I can't even explain the feeling that I had other than there was no one else on earth that could play the role like he could, and God gets all the credit for <laughs> leading us to Gary Nation. Has Irenaeus arrived yet? Indeed, not moments ago. My name is Justin Lewis, and I play the role of Justin in this film. I'm pretty sure I was cast because of my name. I haven't been told that officially, but can't imagine I got this role in any sort of legitimate way other than that. My agent was the one that let me know I'm represented by PC Ginner Talent in Cincinnati. And they called up and said, we have this audition for a movie. Earlier in the audition process, Jericho was talking about, you know, hey, Joe, you might want to audition Rusty from the movie Courageous. And he was like, oh, okay, cool. And I did an audition, a callback audition. And uh, next thing you know, I'm up here in Ohio filming Polycarp. So then I drove up here to Loveland to meet with Joe and Jerrica. And I walked in and I almost said, Oh, I'm sorry, I must be in the wrong place. I'm looking for a callback. <laughs> and because, you know, here are these two kids that could be my, my kids. And so it was quite a surprise. I wasn't expecting them to be that young. I didn't know anything about them. Um, but what I had read of the script, you know, the, the little scenes in the audition and the scenes that they gave me for that day, were well written and were good and they did not sound like they were written by a 20 year old. It really was a shock. I mean, I kept the whole time I kept looking at Joe thinking, he's the director, he's a director, treat him like the director. <laughs> because I just, you know, he's could be my kid. And I actually thought Joe didn't like me because he kept asking me to try different things. And of course he just wanted to see a range, but he asked for so many different things that I thought, oh, he, he must be really looking for something else. I probably didn't give him what he wanted because he asked, I don't know, for six or seven different options. So I was really surprised when I got the next call telling me that, that they wanted me for the role. No, uh, of course, Aaliyah was not the very first person we auditioned for the role. It was a very long process. There were a lot of little girls auditioning and it came down to just a few, which we ended up deciding on Aaliyah, but it was not easy and it, it was a very long process. The Anna character goes through so much struggle and challenge that she really needs to portray that in a very real and meaningful way. Um, and it's just a very heavy um, role. So I wanted to make sure that the girl was capable of being able to pull off that emotion above everything else. And secondary to that, just having the, the look for the character, making sure, you know, they she could pull off the, the long dark hair Mediterranean look and feeling uh, real as a look too for a character as starting off as a slave in that time. I'm gonna get my hair dyed. And how do you feel about it right now? I'm really excited. <laughs> my hair is actually like a dirty blonde, mostly light brown, but it has a blonde in it a little bit. And they had to dye it and it's not a permanent dye. It lasts for three weeks and then it starts fading away. It was really weird seeing me in dark hair. Wow. And it will be really weird to see me in my normal hair again, because I'm used to seeing myself in dark hair. You want to see the funnest part of the day? I'll show you the funnest part of the day right here. Woohoo! 
<laughs> the hair, I actually have very short curly hair. Um, I tried to let it grow out for the movie, but I didn't have a lot of warning ahead of time. So, you know, we got a few more inches, but it really wasn't enough. So Ashton was a lot able to find me these hair extensions and she hadn't even met me when she went to buy them, but she matched them up so well that everybody thought it was my hair. And sometimes when I would go to take them out, I couldn't even tell what was my hair and what was the extension. I had to kind of feel for it because it, I couldn't just see it. And in fact, one day when I showed up early and went to eat without my hair and makeup, two people said, did you cut your hair? Because they thought that my real hair was, you know, was Melina's and that I had all of a sudden had decided to cut my hair in the middle of shooting a movie. <laughs> We're shooting in modern day Turkey, uh, AKA Ohio. And Ohio does not look anything like Turkey. By doing everything with green screen in areas where we would see something that doesn't look period, and then just literally building everything uh, from scratch, from ground up, putting the floor in, putting everything in, that's how we've managed to still sell the look. 90% of the time we've been here at uh, my dad's business and warehouse where we've built everything. Without the idea that we could use our own warehouse, God just orchestrated that in a way that it literally emptied out the month prior to the art department scheduled to show up for starting construction of the sets. And so we saw that absolutely as God leading in the area of using the facility that we already had. By shifting our employees' schedules and moving these, the shoots to night shoots, it's allowed it to be conducive to where we can use most of the office area, uh, all of the warehouse for the set construction, uh, a lower area that is normally used for storage, we were able to use to store the props. A portion of that is used by a contractor for storing his tools and so forth, which he allowed us to use for the construction of the sets. We have a machine shop on site. So literally we have everything here we could need um, for the construction and for the implementation of this film project. Especially because this is a period piece, I have to research every single area uh, to understand the way of living of these people at that time. So either architecture, the way of eating, uh, the customs, the way the house will run. I create my model with real measurements. So then after that, I then put all the dimensions within my sketch. And I take stills of the different areas, put it in a PDF file, and then send it to the art director. Marcella comes to me with a layout or a 3D model or a little plan of what we need to build. Um, and then I take a crew of guys and get the actual materials organized and then we set about to actually make that into real life. Yeah, there's over 2,000 pounds of this stuff on the set. We use this joint compound. Uh, for It's a drywall joint compound. We used it to texture the villa walls and we had to do that three times before we got the look that the director wanted. Uh, the first time we put it on he thought it looked too rough, so then we sanded it down. Um, but then when we put the film lights on it, it washed it all out, so we had to build it back up again. And there's about a half inch on there uh, from all the times we had to do it. But we finally got it right, and it looks really cool in the end. This, oh, boy. My first day on set, I was fortunate with Mr. Uh, Jerry Henline, the executive producer. He kind of gave me a tour of the facility, and I, I was just blown away. Like, they created this villa, this cityscape, this judgment hall in such a small area. And the way they built it too, I mean, you could, pieces were movable and removable and replaceable. We've built over 30 sets in the space that we have, but it has meant that we had tight quarters many times. Usually when you're building a set, you build it one and a half times the actual size to allow for the lighting and the camera and all the different movements that need to happen. The funny thing is we did that, but due to how small things actually were, it still left us feeling like we were very cramped. These right here are the judgment hall doors. I love these doors so much because they almost didn't happen. We had special ordered uh, 
a delivery for these ceiling panels that we put on the door about a month and a half ago. They're supposed to get here in about three weeks. It ended up taking like a month and a half. So here we are like the day before we're filming. We still don't have our ceiling tiles. And they finally come in. So we go pick them up and we bring them back and we're all excited about it. I open up the box and there's only one panel about this big. So we ended up having to do some last minute shopping and just happened to run into an antique mall that had these beautiful ceiling tile panels there. So we were able to buy them up last minute, install them and paint them and they play today. So I'm going to run inside and install them really quick here before they start filming. My favorite set would have to be the marketplace. I love the detail and, you know, the textures and all the little elements that were brought together to make it feel like you were, you know, you know in, a, in the city in second century, Smyrna. Probably my favorite set, though, on this production would probably be the scroll shop. Um, it was just a, a gorgeous location. Uh, the art department did a fantastic job with all the scrolls. It was, you know, a lot of different textures and surfaces and different things to, to hit up with a light. So uh, some of our simplest lighting setups were in there and some of our, you know, prettiest lighting setups were in there. It's just like the set was designed to help me out with different surfaces naturally on there that would bounce back into us. Um, worked out great. So, I mean, like two or three lights and we had the very small location lit very well. <laughs> As a writer, I really, really loved the scroll shop. When you were in that set, you just felt inspired to write. And so I actually had our BTS photographer snap a picture of me really fast sitting at Polycarp's desk because it was, it was one of those really awesome moments. The idea of having 90% of what's happening on this film all in one location has saved us tremendous costs and allowed us to raise the production level in a way that we otherwise would not have been able to. This is your tunic. Yeah. I, be careful when you put it on because there are two layers. We use wool so we lined it with linen. So be sure to go in through here. Okay. Sit in through here, otherwise you'll run into not being able to get out. Boy, the, the costumes are amazing. You never know what to expect, you know, when, when you come to any film set, especially period pieces. You don't know what type of costumes. It's going to be the, the fake Hollywood paper mache armor. Uh, this was not the case. This was real armor, you know? <laughs> I mean, the, the chainmail tunic that they had made for me. It's real. I mean, it's heavy, it, it's bulky, it's amazing, it's awesome. I'm working on putting together a chainmail shirt for Maximus, one of the centurions in the film. Centurions yeah. didn't wear the ordinary segmenta, so we're, we're making this chainmail, which uh, I've put together. It's probably about 32,000 rings in this shirt. So, and they're all little tiny, about a quarter inch round. Put them all together by hand, every single ring. Took a little while. Once you put that on, it's go time. I mean, it, you are 100% in character, and it's amazing how costumes can do that if they're the right costumes, and that's what they have here. And uh, the funny thing is, Andrew Hurt, who plays the Centurion, it's like a light switch when he puts his on. I mean, it, he's off, and then as soon as he puts it on, the light switch flicks on, and he's got that scowl on his face, and he's <laughs> immediately in a bad mood, hating everybody. I've never seen somebody just transform so quickly. This is Lorica Plumata. Uh, Lorica means armor basically in Latin and there are several different types. What our soldiers carry is Lorica segmenta and it's that segmented armor that they wear. This is a little different. This is Lorica plumata. The scales are usually a lot smaller and it's put together by rings. So basically it's like a chainmail shirt with plates of steel on top of it. And the advantage of this is with normal scales, if you stab up, you will be able to either go between the scales or puncture the backing, but with this, you run into a chainmail shirt. This sword is a little bit nicer than uh, some of the other swords. Centurion, his backstory is kind of, he had a, came from a rich family. He is trying to get points with everyone he can because he wants to rise in the Roman army as quickly as possible. So he has a little bit nicer of everything else because of his wealth and uh, prestige. I went with a lot of blue colors for the Christian characters. Um, because I, I was pulling a blue-red contrast with all the Roman characters um, wearing red colors and the Christian characters wearing blue colors and pulling that contrast um, subtly sometimes and sometimes overtly like the soldiers are bright red and you know Roman citizen might be red and he's a Christian sympathizer she has blue stripes not too obvious hopefully but it still gives you a little bit of a clue who's who when you see them for the first time on the screen so Anna because she's not exactly a Christian but she's 
becomes that over the course of the story. She starts out with this greenish blue. She's sort of neutral in between and the, and the yellow. And she goes and lives with a Christian family, so they're all wearing different hues and colors of blue. And our two soldiers are each different. One soldier, he's the, uh, he's the real Roman guy who's the bad guy, you know. So he has, he has his red tunic. But Roman soldiers also wore white tunics. So the sympathetic Roman soldier uh, wears a white tunic. And to still to keep him a little bit Roman, I made his padding that he wears underneath his armor with, um, with this natural neutral color along with a red border to kind of pull out the Roman influence. These are the Caligar or the military sandals that one of our centurions wears. We made a lot of different sandals for the film and they're all handcrafted to fit each character. Since Maximus is the Roman soldier who becomes a Christian at the end of the film, we did some fun things with the design of his costume to sort of hint at that and put the Christian fish into the nails on the bottom of his shoe. And we also worked the motif into the, into the cutouts and the sides of his sandals just to, to add a little bit more meaning to every single piece that, that you see on screen. Oh, I thought everything was amazing. Um, the level of detail that went into everything, the authenticity of the costumes and the props and everything, like I said, down to the amazing tasting food, you know, things that didn't necessarily have to be done, but really were. I found it all amazing and it, it made it so much easier to get into character and to really feel the moment and, and feel, feel what it would have been like to live in that century. The first person to teach me about God's love was a very kind Christian woman named Callisto. That necklace you wear once belonged to her. It took a little while to figure out what we wanted with Anna's necklace. At one point it was maybe going to be precious metal, gold, silver, something along those lines. As the character developed and as the story developed also, we, re we really wanted something that was a blend of rustic, natural materials and maybe a little precious metal. So we have a little bit of silver, tarnished silver, and this material which it almost could pass as ivory or clay because it's not actually either one. It's, it's a modern polymer clay. Then we bake it and then I actually hand carve the design. There are multiples of this because in case it gets lost or broken. Or if there's a second unit. We were shooting here with the young Anna. Same time, second unit was shooting with the uh, necklace on another character um, in another location. So we needed multiples. But the problem is because this is handmade, I had to hand make it uh, very precisely so that they look identical. Realizing how important it was, I didn't just sit down and say, okay, this is what we're gonna do, let's just do it, let's just get it done, what's our budget, and so forth, which is typically what happens. We really put a lot of thought into it. Um, speaking of budget and, and materials and so forth, that is really the probably the strongest driving factor behind how props are made and designed. It's just a s simple question of what does the script call for? What does the director call for? How much money does it cost and how much money do we have? Uh, can we buy it? Can we make it? Can we borrow it? And you may think, well, where are you going to find Roman style this or that, Roman style furniture at thrift stores? The amazing thing is that a lot of Greek and Roman um, designs and patterns and motifs, they're still around today. I'm Felicia Goebel and I'm the Assistant Property Master. Right now I'm cataloging all the items that you can see in the props area. We assign a number to every item that comes in. So it's written on a board, we take a picture with the item, and then we attach a label to each item. This prop is a good example of how we are trying very hard to make this film as historically accurate as possible. This is papyrus from Egypt and rather than using wax seal, which you may see in many movies, historically they didn't have wax seals at the time. So we had clay seals, which is exactly what they would have used. This is actually the first time I've ever done a feature length movie. Coming from a, a more theatrical background where you have time to get into character and then you have a good two, three hours during which you stay in character, um, I wondered what it would be like to take one little snippet, you know, one little scene at a time every day and have to get into that moment and then switch to a completely different moment and go with that. Um, and I found that those details really, really helped. You know, the 
thing I was holding in my hand or the smell from the food or the look of the marketplace or whatever. It, it, the detail and the authenticity was so amazing. It really, it really helped me. And I think it's, it's gonna make it that much more believable and enjoyable for the audience. So we are right now on our way to a tech scout. Um, we're exploring a possible location for one of our uh, climax scenes in the film. And I think probably the best thing about this is that we actually get to get out of the office, which is really needed right now. We were planning on shooting uh, this particular scene at another location, but it wasn't working for us uh, properly. It wasn't fitting the director's vision. So we did some research and our production designer actually found this location, which is a beautiful park and it has mostly all the conditions that we're looking for. We have the opportunity to cheat some of the shots so that we don't see all the modern amenities or the parking lot. I have here an app on, uh, on my little device here that will actually give me an approximate um, look at what it's really going to look like through the red. Uh, so I actually have uh, plugged in here all the settings, the, the sensor size, and the actual lenses that we're going to be shooting on. Uh, so it really gives me a um, an accurate depiction of what it's going to look like through the real lens. So it's kind of cool. I'm Carol Henline, and I was hospitality coordinator on Polycarp, and I also worked in um, many other areas of the film. Finding housing for all the cast and crew was a concern at times. Uh, not so easy to walk up to somebody and say, hey, can we have 10 people stay at your house for a month? And we couldn't really afford hotels. Uh, the Lord really provided there too because there was people that we didn't even know that off opened their home, offered their home to people. God orchestrated all of that and it, it worked out. He, provided all of the gracious hosts that we needed. Carol's job started long before the production did. With our crew that came in for the producing the sets, people here from April all the way through mid-August. I mean, obviously we had a caterer bringing food during the production, but during the pre-production time, she was providing the food. And then during production, she was working in virtually every aspect of the film. Today was a pretty exciting day. We got a lot done. First thing in the morning, we started building some arches for Arch Street, which was going to take a long time, and it did, but we got it all done in one day, which was pretty incredible. Then we had a team of painters, professional contract painters, come out and paint our entire Market Street set, which went by really fast, and I was quite encouraged by that. Uh, did a lot of odd jobs, had some extra volunteers in doing some painting for us. So yeah, pretty excited. Got a lot done, uh, a lot more to do, but we're getting there. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Andrew Bolzman. I am the second assistant director for Polycarp that we're shooting in this fantastic warehouse right here. Uh, it really is truly a studio shoot, which is amazing as we have all of our indoor locations here. We built the sets here. We've got everything going on and we are just starting to uh, get towards the end of week one and we have had quite a week indeed. We started uh, in our, what we're gonna call our back lot, which is just a bunch of sets that we built out back behind. Uh, and we had our largest days of the whole production as day one and two. And coming into this, we were a little concerned that it was gonna be just blazing hot and that everyone was going to die of sunstroke or some such thing. And what we ended up having was not a heat issue, but rather a rain issue. We had uh, about 50 extras and we had some animals and we had, I mean, it was just market, all of our costumes and everything else going and we got rained on for several days in a row. Hey, Mark. They posted a reward for Polycarp. Action! Demetrius, he's insane. Go, you must go warn him now. You know how to get to Jason's. <laughs> <laughs> well, Justin's. My bad. Still rolling, back to one. All right, back to one, everybody. You know how to get to Justin's. Be careful. Run, Anna, run! Yeah. Which hand did you smear it with? Which did it you was grab? this one. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm.
You know how to get to Justin's. Be careful. Run! Run, Anna! Moving on. See, look, the uh, storm was headed straight for us, pretty bright red. We prayed and it just went chunk, Thank just barely missed us. The relationships that Joe and Jerrica have developed in their other filmmaking experience on other film sets has brought together a team of young people that are just phenomenal. This has probably been the biggest, most significant thing I've been part of thus far. I'm really impressed with the a average age of the crew versus the experience. It seems like a very, for the average age that they are, it's a very tight ship they run. All right, everybody, we're gonna go again here. Let's lock it up, please. Lock it up. My first day on set was uh, the last scene of the film. It had to be that way because my character has a beard and Justin has a beard and it had to kind of translate us to be a lapse of time. Um, so we had to shoot that first so we could move on with life and get our hairs cut and everything like that. At one point we split off into a second unit and sent off a portion of our crew to an off-site location uh, to get a, a one specific scene and then come back. And for that time, it was while it was raining, we piled up in our vans and took off. It was pouring rain, just pouring rain. Um, on the way to our location, we drove out of the rain. We had a blazing, amazing sunset that went over the lake that we were shooting at. It was just fantastic, exactly what we needed. Unbeknownst to everybody involved, there was a fishing competition of sorts on this lake. And so we did have to put up with these boats going back and forth. And we didn't know it was really a fishing competition. We just thought it was just people out on the lake. Um, but it wasn't that big of a deal at first because everybody was so far back, you know, we could shoot around it. But eventually there was one boat that seriously parked its boat and dropped its anchor like right behind where we were trying to shoot. <laughs> when we're trying to shoot Justin, you know, his back to the lake, you can see this big boat there. And, uh, you know, they, they're they casting their line and they're fishing and Jerry Henline was there on, on that on location there. He's the executive producer. He, he walks over and says, uh, hey, gentlemen, uh, would you mind moving your boat just for a short period of time so we can, we're filming here and we just need you to move just for, for a little bit. And boy, did these guys just give it to him. I mean, they were yelling at him, barking at him, saying, hey, you own the lake? You know, the, we're trying to make money here. You know, we, that's when we found out there was some sort of fishing competition. The even funnier thing was, is for about 45 minutes, I had to stare that direction because like I said, this boat was directly behind my eye line to Justin. They didn't catch one fish. Not one fish. Always exciting when you're on a film set, out in public park, you never know what's going to happen, but uh, the Lord blessed us with some good footage. We're very grateful. Right when we left, it started raining again. So God, like, blocked off this set of time to say, we, there's no rain here. These guys need to get this work done. Um, so it was just amazing. The time we got there, it stopped raining. The time we left, it started again. And we were only there for maybe two hours, but... Oh my goodness, like that two hours was like the only time of the day where it didn't even drizzle. It was an amazing experience, um, just how much God's hand is in this project, and he wants us to tell this story. Action. Friends, it is by the grace of God that we are all here tonight. We are gathered for a very special occasion. So what we have here is a RED camera, which when we're filming at 4K, which is a super high resolution for like cinema quality. Out here we have like a matte box that helps the lights to not flare in the lens. This little guy, we were shooting with RED lenses, batteries, some extra gears for focusing and making sure we work with audio. So we have a wireless follow focus for this camera, which is kind of cool because you can be like over here with this guy and be like focusing the camera, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's kind of a little bit of a pain sometimes because it takes a long time to calibrate when we're changing lenses. Um, and sometimes it just decides not to work. But when it is working, it's pretty cool. Mark. Okay, the slate is one of the most iconic pieces of filmmaking. People are, have seen that, that, that uh, black and white bar that comes down like that. But do they know what it does? It's uh, a record-keeping system. We have the name of the production here. We have the roll, which means how many uh, different rolls of film in this case now, how many different hard drives we've filled up. We have the scene number, and then we're on take one. The director 
and then the camera operator are credited there and the date of filming is down there and then these three little bits down here we use to specify details about the shot MOS just means without sound it comes from an old German word and that tells us whether we're shooting day or night scenes and uh, the camera itself is probably about 20 to 30 pounds uh, with the dolly it's probably 35 40 obviously doing a lot of studio work meant shooting a lot of uh, interiors for exteriors, and that worried me quite a bit. Um, trying to make an inside look like an outside during the daytime. So we discussed and troubleshot, and, uh, and finally came up with a conclusion after the first day of shooting, and we realized that what we had wasn't going to work, and we got a bigger light to just create the uh, general feel of daytime uh, outside in a warehouse. The exciting part was when we got to go to the interiors on some of these gorgeous locations and uh, at that point John and I would walk through the locations and kind of find all the, pl all the places where natural light would be coming in um, to motivate from that so we'd get the strongest light coming from uh, a window or a door, something like that and then if there was a candlelight or something going and then try to uh, amplify reality. Here in the holding cell that we're shooting today, it's, it's a daytime shop. Primarily motivated by one little uh, barred okay. window there. We like to get a lot of the light rays. That was a, a look that John really wanted to work throughout the film, and we've been marginally successful in, in getting that. One of the biggest challenges that we had with lighting was the atrium having a 4x4 four four hole in the ceiling where we had to get direct sunlight coming down from that. Instead of putting the light above and shooting it down, we put a reflector board up above it, shot a light directly into that, and then down. So we could change the angle a little easier. It meant we could move our lights faster uh, for quicker setups as we turned around and saw other sets because we knew we had a tight schedule. We knew we had uh, you know, limited time to, to do really immaculate setups, so we, we'd spend our time on the first setup, and then once it was good, um, we'd just tweak from there. The nameplate on this, this 2000 watt light that we've been using here is uh, it's a Walt Disney light. It came from Walt Disney Studios, so there's a good chance it's been on quite a few other movies that you probably already seen. The warehouse that we are shooting at, our, our happy little studio here, is a working business, which means as a film crew, we are sharing the space with the regular employees here. Um, and so what that's translated to is we, uh, we are working nights while they work the days. Uh, first couple days we were outside out back so we shifted, they, they could work inside, we were working outside. As we go inside we are shifting our schedule to a night schedule where we show up at 3 uh, p.m. in the afternoon and we work until 3 a.m. So that's what's going on right now actually as you can kind of see the sun is setting here um, and we are just not even halfway through our day yet and we're going to be going long into the night. But uh, it's fun stuff, movie making. I am Carrie Farrell and I am the extras coordinator. How did I get them all wrong up? Well, I'm going to have to say it was God because um, on day zero I could see God's hand in it because I only had two men and I needed about six and I just had men walking in the door saying he called me and I hadn't called them and it was just perfect. I ended up getting more men than I needed and it was perfect for the set. This is our second day on set and um, our most full day on set and uh, we're about three-fourths of the way through the day. It's been most excellent being able to hear Polycarp speak because I know it's from the heart. He's bringing the Word of God and to know that this is going to reach out and touch millions of people and change lives. It's awesome to be a part of that. You hear some people say, oh, you know, you're, you're going to be there for hours and you might get bored. And I haven't had a, a boring moment. It's, uh, it's been well spent. I am trying to cushion the blow of this door. Almost. Almost. One more thing. We should do a documentary on all the floors I sweep. I sweep floors, take out the trash, and make sure the perimeter is secure, and keep everything that on set that you don't see running. That and Ryan, because Ryan's around here somewhere. I'm taking his credit. Test. Wait. Almost. This is not an average film shoot per se, because we are getting about seven hours of sleep. On an average film shoot, a locations person would be doing good to get three to four hours of sleep every night. So we're doing awesome. We are the last ones to leave. We do get out about 5.30 to 6 almost every night, but we're still getting seven hours of sleep. Noise causes mad first ADs, causes mad DPs, mad directors. On a film set, noise is a bad thing. So you have no noise, you have happy first ADs, you have happy DPs, you have happy directors, and happy crew. If I had to pick between uh, one location shoot and a 15 location shoot, honestly, I would pick one. 
because this is, it takes 30 seconds to get to either end of this location, and that's very manageable. Well, if we have 15 locations, and if we were, even if we were filming in different places, then we have to be split up, which makes it hectic. And for every location, everything has to be left the way it was found or better. So it would just be whew, crazy. Watch, this, this is what you call a film door. Okay, ready? Nothing. Nothing. I, it's like it's made for film. <laughs> My role as a PA is basically to make sure. Hold on. Hey guys, can we lock it up? Thank you. I'm trying to do an interview. My role as a key bit, PA is doing just that, locking it up on set sometimes. Usually one of the other PAs who has a bigger voice than I does that. As a key PA, my main responsibility is walking talent to and from set. So making sure that uh, we have eyes on them at all times, getting them through hair, makeup, and wardrobe, making sure they have water, making sure they are cool, making sure they're warm if we're outside and it's 50 degrees, making sure that they are feeling well, and if they're not, what can I do to help them? Pretty much their mother role is kind of what I've taken on. At least I feel like I'm their mother. I even make them sleep sometimes, like go take a nap. It's kind of funny, that's one of, that's one of the things Gary Nation said, I was like his mother on set. So it's kind of weird because he's a lot older than me. I think some of the scenes that are most memorable for me for last week were the ones uh, uh, in the prison cell with Germanicus and uh, Demetrius. Um, Demetrius got beat up. My brother volunteered as, uh, as the person who will beat me up, like real. <laughs> but nah, I just have to go with her. So I'm gonna beat him up. You know. She's actually gonna beat me She's up. She's nicer about it. We're gonna say it's makeup, you know, for legal reasons. Legal purposes, you know, but really that, you know, like beating people up on the side. She's very specific <laughs> yeah. in yeah. her beatings. <laughs> Did you see Andrew's? Very accurate. Cut? Yeah, that was, that was yeah, real. Was a Oh, this could be like one of the like fast moving parts. Yeah, you know, like how they do that. No, I don't know what I'm talking up. about. Yeah. Yeah, like they speed it up. It's really hard for me not to smile because I like to smile. Oh, I want to smile right now. <laughs> oh, I want to smile. Oh, I really want to smile. I'm not, I'm not gonna smile. I'm not gonna smile. You're next. <laughs> You'll probably want to edit some of this out because it might be a little bit of a process. So I'm about to print prelim call sheets for tomorrow and these are like um, a, a glance at tomorrow's schedule that we pass out to department heads so they get a chance to approve it. So I'm gonna start. We're starting by loading the colored paper in the printer. So now I'm uh, going to open up the PDF of the call sheet for tomorrow. And I'm just going to quick start a print job on this. All right, and we're back to the printer to pick up the prelims. So they're printing. Take a little bit here. Prelims are really important because they allow the departments to be able to see what's up for the next day so that they can prepare their team and their crew um, so that nothing tomorrow takes them by surprise. Finally, okay, the prelims are done. But we have to print the watermark on them so everyone knows their prelims. So, we're back to the office. Okay. Print away. Back to the printer. Perfect. Look at that beautiful blue watermark.
They're done. Okay. Here we go. Oh. A prelim. Today's flavor is aqua seaweed. <laughs> would you like a prelim? I would, thank you. So sometimes this can be the difficult part of passing out prelims is because everyone is working on set and you don't really have time to look at prelims. So I just do my best and if they're busy, I let them work. They're busy. I think that's about it. I think we hit everyone. And we have three extra left, so we can make paper airplanes. All of this for like a 15 second scene, totally worth it though. Totally worth it. It was awesome. That's real right there. It was like the circus. Intense. That one's, that one's awesome. All right, so this is Jasper, and Jasper, this is Ashton Ballinger. So Ashton, I don't know your thoughts on the look. I was thinking she, we probably need to add a little bit of hair, maybe? I think that would perfect. I think they would bring out the eyes. Let's check that out. All right. See if Jasper likes some hair going on. How you look, Jasper? Oh, I love it. I think we totally could add some hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some bangs going forward, kind Perfect. of in lightener. Yeah, I think we could curl her hair too. Great. To really complement the two of them together. <laughs> I was really surprised uh, how well the cat delivered its lines. It did. It was. It, I mean, just so natural. Yeah. You know, it's almost lifelike. What was the line? Or it was like. Yeah, I think there was a couple of licks, like. Made a face and it jumped down. I nailed it every time. Yeah. There is a shadow approaching us quickly, and we must be ready. All right now, I am uh, getting in the best position to uh, capture good sound, and because it's a small room and. Uh, the, the way the lighting is set up, I can't be inside the room, otherwise I'm going to be causing shadows. So I had to come up here and boom down into the room. Yes, and, and try not to hit actors. Honestly, the food on this production has been outstanding. It's probably the best I've had on any of the other sets I've worked on. It comes in good quantities, it tastes good, it's got that homemade flavor, and that's what I like about it. Yeah, it's having me. Scrumptious. Wonderful. Amazing. Awesomeness. Like, amazing. Scrumptious. Oh, bacon. Tastes pretty good. Outstanding. Scrumptious. Oh man. Oh my. Oh wow. <laughs> oh man. Oh no. Back in June, I started baking for this whole endeavor. I baked six pound cakes in one day. I did like 20 pounds of cookie dough in a day, I, you know. And I tried to keep up with it, but honestly, once production started and it got crazy, it's just pounds and pounds and pounds of butter. I mean, we, I would probably say at a minimum 60 pounds of sugar, at a minimum. We roasted 24 chickens in one day. That made chicken tacos, it made chicken and dressing, it made Hawaiian chicken. We were sick of the chicken that day. <laughs> and now it is two o'clock. So it is time for breakfast. I get up around 2 o'clock and I leave the house around like 2.15 and then I get there at 2.30, I eat breakfast. It's breakfast to us because we're on nights and then I get in costume and in here they put these clips in my hair to make the curls stay because my hair is really straight as you can see right now. Hair has a hard time because my hair just doesn't like to curl. You know scene 119 where you're walking? 
Yeah. We are actually filming that in two different places. You're standing in front of a green screen for this whole conversation. So we'll film that up first, and then we'll later on tonight get the walking and the part of that stuff. I go in makeup, and then some. Usually we have blocking t um, after makeup, so we go to blocking, and then. I come back and get the clips out of my hair, get my hair fixed and stuff, and then right, when we go down to set, we do an angle, and then we come back to the green room, or usually it's by crafty because the setup is usually doesn't take too long. We keep doing that over and over and over, so it's on set, off set, on set, off set, on set. We're on and off set a lot, so it's nice to get down to stand set like the whole time because it gets very, very, very hot. The hair people, it's hard for them because since my hair is straight and it's hot, they have to recurl it about five times a day. Apparently we're moving to a new location and uh, half the warehouse has to come with us. Well, I mean, at least the gear in the warehouse. Today we were filming at a tree farm. The first shot we did, we had to run down the hill. Then I had to run back, in, back up. And then we got in the car, went to this field, which was really pretty because the sun was setting. And I was running through the field and I came back. And then I had to do it again and I came back. And then we got in the car again. And we went to this pretty woods. It was like this road going through woods. And they got in a truck, had the camera in the back, and I was running while the truck was driving in front of me. It's pretty crazy, pretty hectic. We did a lot of um, running around to get our shots before it got dark, because that was a big thing. We only had a few hours to get the shots we needed to get before it got dark. And we're on our way back to the production office now for lunch and another three and a half hours of shooting. Booyah! We eat lunch at 9 till like 10 and we have like a devotion after lunch and then after that we're back on set till 3. Usually it's later because there's so much to do. So we're usually done around like 3.30 or 4 and then they have supper and bags. So you go home and eat and usually I talk for like 10 or 15 minutes but usually Usually they tell me to go to bed. I go to bed and start the whole day all over again. Hi. Okay. Joe's strength is, again, that he's able to find those moments with you. He's so sensitive to who he's working with and how they work and just how to find those scenes. And he's got quite an eye for it. The adjustments he makes are, are strong and appropriate adjustments. He's just, a, he's just a cool guy. When I first read a script, the first thing I like to do is dig into the different messages that each scene is trying to convey. And then I immediately start to visualize um, the look of some of the different characters and the different scenes and how it all comes together. This is my first film and so far it has been really fun and a really great experience for me. She's shown amazing endurance and resilience through this grueling shoot. And as hard as I've worked, as many scenes as I've worked on, she's worked harder. Oh, she is, she's a ray of sunshine. I love working with Leah. it was really easy. We met on Skype a few days before I came on the set. And already I could tell that I was gonna enjoy working with her because she is just, like a ray of sunshine. She comes in and lights up the room. She has a wonderful smile. She has a great sense of humor. She's um, humble. She is just pleasant. She's always happy. She'll take any opportunity to laugh and to joke around and just, just be happy. Um, so that's really nice, especially with, you know, the weird schedules we've had and sometimes we're dragging around being tired and stuff. It's so nice to have that sort of energy. It is so easy to act a scene with her because her responses are so real that it requires me to be just as real in the way that I interact with her Anna character on screen. When Anna is happy, it brightens my heart. And when Anna is sad, it breaks my heart. Oftentimes in independent Christian films, 
The preaching scenes come across as not real or genuine, and it deters an audience instead of pulls them in. Gary Nation told me on screen, when I'm talking to God, when I'm sharing God with people, I don't act. <laughs> I'm really doing that, and I believe it in my heart. And I think somehow that came through in his delivery of the lines and the performance of how he expressed himself in the preaching and in the prayer scenes. It's been really fun to see uh, Joe take my story and make it into a feature film. It's been really incredible, and I've really loved seeing the actors uh, play their roles because Honestly, they're doing a way better job doing the characters than what I had in my head. So that's been really, really rewarding as a writer to see your characters come to life. And that's probably been my favorite part over the entire production is just watching the acting uh, and bringing the characters to life. You know, I said Courageous was like the biggest film set we had been on, but there was so many people that were part of it, which is good. But it got kind of hard to get to know people, whereas here on Polycarp, it's a very immediate family atmosphere. I mean, you come in and everyone is just willing to grab hold of you and just be able to be like, hey man, how are you doing? Checking up on you, really figuring out how good your day is and they actually genuinely care. We realize that we're working towards a greater purpose than just making a film. We're making a film that glorifies God. We are here on week four now, uh, and we just had a rap party last night. A rap party is where you celebrate wrapping up principal photography, which we just had last night, but we have not finished filming yet. So we have two more days left, and the reason we're doing that is because we ran into some troubles at the beginning of production with some rain. But we just extended filming for another three days, but we went ahead and had the wrap party because a lot of people were meeting. It was a lot of fun. The wrap party was incredible. A lot of videos and pictures and a lot of just fun things happened, so it was really great and a really sad time too. This is hot chocolate. I, I like to call it Jericoco. Joe makes the Hojo, which is hot chocolate and coffee. And when I make hot chocolate, it's Jericoco. Get it? It's it's really not Jericho, as in Jericho from the Bible. It's Jericho. That's a lame that's great. Okay, everybody. Um, we have an announcement here. No, I don't want to leave. <laughs> this is a picture wrap on our beloved Mother Now. We are officially picture wrap on Elias. <laughs> that is a wrap on Demetrius. <laughs> We have a picture wrap on Irenaeus. Picture wrap on Virius. That is a picture wrap on Justin. Oh. <laughs> Second sure. announcement, um, and certainly a lot harder for all of us I know, is it's a picture wrap on Polycarp. So we are nearing the end of the shoot as we reach the final shot. Um, I kept asking for more takes. Um, it was just. Aaliyah, you know, looking, it was a reaction shot. It was simple, you know, all the crew was waiting around to hear the final rap call. Um, but even though somehow, and deep down inside I knew that I had captured enough in the very first take, I couldn't stop and I wanted more. And I think I asked for four to five takes just because I didn't want it to be over. All right, guys. Um, <clears throat> first things first here. Um, we have <clears throat> a couple picture wraps to announce. This is a picture wrap for our lovely star, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing Josh call, um, that's a wrap on Polycarp, and I was not expecting what was coming next. And uh, last of all, it's a picture wrap on Polycarp. <laughs> when 
and I think it was a mixture of happy and sad tears. Happy that, you know, we had reached this point and we had seen the Lord do so many wonderful things and it was completed, yet sad that it was completed because we knew that it was all coming to an end. I will admit that I did not cry. <laughs> I think I was the only crew member who did not cry. Way to ruin the moment, Jerica. Right now, we are starting a uh, first shot for pickups, which is um, shots that we missed or found out we actually needed after working on the editing. And uh, today's first day of that, and first shot will be up in, in a few minutes. It feels a little bit like home. So many memories here, that you, when you see it, immediately they all come back to your head. And the great part is, is that we get to make more memories on set, which is really exciting, really looking forward to that. This is first shot of pickups for Polycarp. We are about to roll. Mark? Yep. I mean, when you're doing pickups, there's two different kinds. Sometimes you're doing ins entire scenes that fit into the new overall edit of the film. And then there's inserts that are there are shots that have to match other shots before and after it. I mean, all the lighting has to match, all the hair and clothing, makeup, all that has to match so that it's seamless and you can't tell that we shot it at a different time, a different day, even in a different year sometimes. Um, so yeah, this one we were trying to get the lighting just right and the angle just right and the hair just right because it all had to match other stuff we've already filmed. Okay, here we are at, this is the new set that we have designed for the pickups. This location in the city is uh, supposed to be close to the harbor, so where all the merchandise comes in. And here we're going to be filming where all the slaves are also coming because they're also for sale. So that, that shows you uh, the balance between objects and people at the time. They were considered pretty much objects. Then you pick up one Bravo, take two. Well, right now, um, we are doing a slave scene. It's a new one. And um, it's actually really fun. And um, that's why I'm all yucky. I've always loved getting dirty and nasty. I don't know why. Be free! There's someone here to see you. Please, bring him in. Okay, the scene we just shot uh, originally was for, for Quadratus. Um, he was at a point in the script where Quadratus would come in and see Polycarp demanding answers, demanding compliance. And the way it was uh, originally written uh, did make sense, but they felt uh, in post-production when they watched it that it maybe didn't put Quadratus in a high enough power as he deserves to be. So they rewrote it to where it could make sense, gave Quadratus power, and gave Maximus and, and Polycarp a proper introduction. So one of the fun shots we got to do tonight was the shot of the, the villa and scroll shop on fire. Now we did a couple different passes. The first one was just a, a dry pass where we had some lights inside that were flickering. And then we did a second pass where there was smoke inside the villa pumping out. So we had a little bit of smoke coming out towards the door and then we just pumped as much smoke as we could out through the, the scroll shop. And when we wrapped for the day, then a couple of us went outside and we got to record some of the fire elements that then we can use in post-production to add the fire to, coming out the windows or um, burn, just burning the scroll shop down. I was the one that was asked to uh, oversee this part of the visual effects, handling most of the fire stuff. So I'm gonna be getting this footage and gonna be adding the, the, the fire to them, maybe increasing the smoke and adding some heat waves, just to try to make it look as realistic as possible and keeping uh, with everybody's expectations of what a fire, what a house on fire looks like. With Gladiators, it's all about the show. It's entirely about what looks cool. Because it was theatrical, they gave them weapons that you would never use in a real fight. For instance, you had the Secutor, which was, the name means the Chaser. And he was armed with a round shield, a helmet, greaves, an arm piece called a manica. And he had this tiny little dagger. And basically, he had to get in close and do his thing. 
And he fought, usually what they would do is they would have different pairings of gladiators that always fought to, most usually fought together. So it wasn't just a mishmash. You had these types of gladiators usually fought each other, and these types. So one really common pairing and very popular, and we used it in our film, was the Redearius versus the Secutor. And the Redearius is the guy with the trident and the net. He has a manica and a pauldron a piece on his shoulder. And it's really neat the way they designed everything to work together because the Secutor's armor doesn't have any points on it. The shield is round. The helmet is all curved so that there's nothing for the net to grab on. And he has a short weapon because you get the interplay between the long weapon in the net of the Ready Arius versus the really short weapon in the shield of the Secutor. And in the end, you have a much, much more interesting fight. Of course, after the movie shot, it's not done. You know, a lot of people think that once we film the movie, the work is done and, you know, the job is completed. But really, in many ways, it's just beginning. After everybody goes home, it's time to sort through the footage. And you have hours and hours of footage that you need to sort through and process. For several months, I began to assemble the assembly cut and just a lot of the different um, first edit, you know, first rough draft edit things that were going on. Because that would help him become intimately familiar with all the footage. And then we were able to bring in another editor to take it from there. It's really helpful if you can bring in somebody that has a fresh perspective. And that's exactly what our editor, John Clay Burnett, brought to the table. He understood why we shot different things. He also is a very creative thinker, so he has fresh ideas um, and ways to edit scenes that most of us would not even think of. We made some change to Anna's character and how she develops. Um, somebody commented that it seemed like she opened up and she was too comfortable in the home of the Christians too early in the film. So we, we shifted that a little bit and made it so that she's, she's a little more quiet and she's unsure of, of, this, of this new environment. And then something happens. It was the scene where Anna drops the water pot. Um, you know, coming from a background of slavery, she would expect her new parents to be um, really mad at her and beat her or something like that. But when she saw how they responded and they just were very kind and forgiving, then that helped her to, to see that these were really good people that she could open up to. When it comes to putting together a scene in the editing room, one thing's for sure when it comes to deciding on which takes to use, it's not easy. <laughs> um, I usually like to, for emotional scenes, I have to get into a dark, quiet room and really study and focus and feel the emotion along with the character. You know, I put myself exactly where they are in the scene and, you know, watch each take and see which one just feels the best. Another frequently used method is I like to um, call Jerrica down and I might have several options and just kind of get her opinion on which one she thinks works best. I have a different, you know, perspective. And some takes he thinks are really good. I'm like, eh, it's okay. And some things things I think are really um, good. He's like, I don't know. And then sometimes we agree, and then we know that it's a good take. You might think that once you have completed the script that that's it and you have your movie. But really there's three different movies that come together. That You have the script stage, uh, that's locked and that's your that's your story that you're going to shoot from but during production you're going to improvise actors are going to come up with suggestions and you're going to find out that certain things didn't work and so then you really end up shooting a second version of the story when you get into editing you end up creating the final version which can sometimes be very vastly different from the script We always knew that we were going to need some visual effects to help sell this world that the characters lived in. We just didn't know how much. What makes visual effects interesting and challenging is the broad range of skill sets required to make a single shot come together and work. And because of this, there's almost always, no matter what scale you're at, a benefit to collaboration. Most of our team members were working remotely, 
they were all in different states. Some of them were in different countries. In order to get things done efficiently, we had to adhere to sort of the tried and true process of concept and then bringing the shot through several stages, um, it, with each stage being reviewed and approved um, by the director, by you know Joe, by, by Scott. And even then, the process was dynamic and each shot presented its own unique set of challenges. There were quite a few visual effects shots that were added during pickups and they were specifically added because an early version of the edit just felt really tight and up close and we didn't have any wide shots at all, or at least it felt that way. We ended up adding a bunch of wide shots uh, through visual effects and I think it really does help to strengthen the film and make it seem more wide open and, and like the real world. This scene at the beginning of the film was shot against a green screen right outside the main studio. Johnny Reichard sketched out the concepts with lots of direction and back and forth with Joe. Nick Giasulo took Johnny's concepts and created from them digital matte paintings, which you can see here in the final background. The composite of the onset footage was done by Mutiny Effects, who were able to take 21 green screen shots and turn them around very, very quickly. There was a specific set piece built for this shot, uh, which you can see here, just a small portion of the overall final image. But then Johnny Reichard went in and drew the concept for the, for the rest of the image, and uh, Nick completed it as a, as a matte painting. These market set extensions were some of the earliest mats we began working on. Green screen shots can be deceptively complicated. Often you'll find that what looks straightforward can turn out to be incredibly intricate. Shad Aish handled a large portion of the film's green screen composites, uh, including these shots here. Uh, he was able to maintain a very natural feel to the composite. Uh, for this one, the, the lower half existed already as a set piece, and, and the upper half was designed as a 3D set extension. Lots of revisions to get this one right. Uh, Jeff Hustis did the CG work, including the computer-generated soldiers that populated both the upper and lower half of the building. Uh, the extras were the same 15 or so volunteers rearranged in front of a green screen over and over to complete the gathering of people down below. There were a lot more subtle effects as well. Uh, often we needed to extend just a small portion of the set. Uh, effects like this can be quick to finish, but they require a level of familiarity and dexterity with your tool set that can only be gained through a lot of experimentation and trial and error. The bigger shots are really just a different application of these basic skill sets. Each of these require camera match moving, painting, color matching, and a host of other skills as well. Sometimes you have visual effect shots that were not planned to be visual effect shots in, in the first place. For example, the a lake scene at the end of the film where some fishermen came and put their boats right in front of where we were filming behind our actors and it, it was not period accurate so we had to erase the boats uh, with visual effects. Uh, another scene was uh, filmed at a Christmas tree farm where you had these rows of perfectly pruned Christmas trees in the background and it, it just didn't fit so we erased them and gave it a new landscape. The first step on a project like this is research. When you're trying to recreate something that actually existed, you want to find as many examples of what that looked like as possible. The Colosseum in Rome is a great example of the type of stone and the stonework, but it's a lot bigger than the arena would have been in Smyrna. Smaller towns like El Gem in Tunisia have smaller arenas that are still standing, and so we looked very closely at pictures from these smaller arenas. The next step is concept art. So you take all of your research and you take the images that have been shot and you do some really rough sketches or paintings of what the finished product should look like to make sure that you're going in the right direction. Then comes experimentation. The first experiment was to take a flat painting and bend it into a cylinder and to see if that would actually be sufficient. And it wasn't. So the next step was to build a three-dimensional model of the arena and to actually put three-dimensional computer-generated people inside, and that didn't look quite good enough either. So we got together a bunch of people and uh, with some bedsheet togas, uh, we shot them against a green screen and put together a crowd of hundreds of people that could easily become thousands and thousands of people. So to build a 3D model of the arena involved some very simple cylindrical shapes for the seats 
and for the walls and for the arches, but those gradually got more complicated with stairs and flagpoles and things like that. And then it also required a lot of painting of the texture of the rocks that was going to go on to that 3D model. For the flags that hang on the flagpole up above the arena, it's actually much easier to cut thin strips of fabric and shoot those at high frame rates and get those to look like giant flags than it is to do those in animation. So to put all the pieces together, we take the shots from the set and paint out anything that doesn't need to be there and paint in things that do need to be there like extra dirt and then start adding in the pieces of the arena and start adding in all of our people, all of the digital crowd extras, then the flags, then extra elements like dirt or blood stains, tweak the edges and color correction. For Polycarp's final scene, it's a very different mood, which is shown in several different ways. It's a different type of atmosphere. It's a different time of day. The weather is different. So that involved rendering the arena with different light. It involves shooting some flags with a little bit different amount of wind on them. And then of course there's also the smoke and the fire. And so for that we shot a bunch of different fires, um, different sizes of fire at different frame rates and started to combine those together to get the look that we were after. And then also created a bunch of sparks digitally so we had a little bit more control over them. And then another element that's very important for selling fire and heat is the heat distortion and the ripple that you get when something is hot. Now most of the time you see the arena at a distance and the people are very small and it's usually out of focus which helps uh, quite a bit. That's why you don't notice that most of the extras in the stands are wearing blue jeans and checkered shirts. But parts of the arena needed to be finished at a very high resolution. The paintings of the textures of the stones on the wall had to be seen up close because we used some of the tunnels and arches from the arena behind Anna when she's holding on to the grate. Everything that you see behind her, the tunnel that goes back, torches on the wall, those are things that were done in CG using the same arena model and the same arena textures, just closer.